you can see um, actually where some of the bulbous forms are a slight nod to that previous glass blowing. But um, I chose um, ceramics because I, I love the material, I love the clay, I love the possibilities. And um, I'm just going to go through the three different types of raku that I do at the moment. So I have the glazed raku, which are these pieces, which you will find on the website. These are for sale on the website with handmade. These are my green glazed pieces. All of the work is either wheel thrown, generally modified in some way, um, or handmade. Um, I have to say lockdown last year gave me a lot more time to develop handmade pieces and I started to work on flattened forms, this type of form. So, and this has been a great joy actually to actually hand build. Um, and so the process starts with the decisions to where I'm going to end up because the pieces that are going to be naked, i.e. pieces like this and the white piece that I just showed you are naked raku. That means that all of the coatings peel away and we come back to the clay body. So from the start, I need to think about color in my clay. So the clay is stained and I use an underglaze or a body stain to, to, glaze, to stain the glaze, the clay material rather, before I even start to work with it, before I go on the wheel. So that's the first step in the process. Then the clay is allowed to become leather hard. And at that point, I then will use a terrace gelata to coat the clay so that I can then burnish it. The burnishing is really important because you want a nice, really smooth, tactile surface when you finish. So the burnishing is really important. Then the pieces are fired in a traditional electric kiln to that's a bisque firing. After the bisque firing, the pots are taken out. They're then coated with a slip. Slip is liquid clay. So the coating of the liquid clay coating, the slip goes on first. If I want to uh, mask any areas because I want them to be black. That happens before the slip is applied. So for something like this, this is one of the most intricate pieces I've made. This is all masked using different tapes and using um, the tapes that I have here. So these tapes can be bought quite easily. I used to have to buy them from China, but now they're available here. These are plastic tapes, so they do bend. You can create a curve with them. And the tops are masked, obviously. All of this is masked. The slip is then applied. The slip then has to dry. It has to be completely dry. When it's dry, then I apply the glaze coating. So this is how the pot looks at that point. This is the glaze layer. Underneath here, I have a slip layer. This then goes into my outdoor raku kiln. I have two kilns, a very tall one for large pieces and a shorter one. All of these areas that you can see are blue will become black because the slip and the glaze are going to be the pieces that fall away. So that's the coating, goes into the raku kiln. This goes up to about 750, 800 degrees. At that point, the lid comes off the kiln the pot is taken out with tongs and it's put into my sawdust pits. That stays in there for about 40 minutes, 30 to 40 minutes, covered completely with sawdust. There are other materials and I've tried damp paper um, and larger wood pieces. So it stays in the kiln. After 30, 40 minutes, it's removed from the sawdust pit and it's left to cool at ambient temperature. At that point, all of this material shivers and falls away from the pot. And it's only at that point, I know what I'm going to end up with. So it's only at that point, I know if this is going to have worked. So it's, it's quite a planned process, but the markings other than where I've masked 
all of these lightning markings are completely and utterly unique and random. To, down to patches that come here. The only thing I can dictate are where the slip is in the first instance. So that is the naked Raku element of what I do. With glazing, obviously, I don't need, I want the glaze to be fine in the Raku kiln. It goes to a higher temperature, again, taken out with tongs, this time taken out at about 900, 950 degrees with tongs and placed into the sawdust pits. But in this case, the glaze stays on. So it's really important that I've got a good covering of the glaze. With this pot, I also have a nine carat gold luster ring on the pot and on this other one here that you can see. So that the glaze firing comes out, goes into the sawdust pits, and then after 30, 40 minutes is taken out and allowed to cool. It's a very harsh process. The, unfortunately, after all of the planning and preparation, often they crack at this point because of the thermal shock. We rely on thermal shock to give us the crazing, which allows the carbon from the, the sawdust pits to permeate, but also that thermal shock can uh, crack the pot. So, you know, it's about 50-50 success at the moment. The other thing that I've been working on um, is the, the horsehair raku. And I like to have a very heavily burnished pot. So again, it's made in the traditional way, fired in the electric kiln, but this piece would start life as this. So it's been burnished, it's been heavily burnished. It's going to go into the kiln with no coating whatsoever. So you can see the importance of having that burnished finish. So it's put into the kiln, it's taken up to about 900 degrees, um, it can go 800, that's fine for horsehair. At that point, again, taken out with tongs, but in this case, it's put onto um, a fire brick and we literally, it's called horsehair because it's horsehair that we use. So strands of horsehair are taken and they're applied to the pot. Now, when the pot first comes out, it's too hot and the horsehair will burn away. So I can use just little specks of sugar. When the sugar makes a dark mark and it stays on the pot, then I know I've got about 30 seconds of working time, maybe 40 if it's a hot day. That makes quite a difference. So at that point, then the horsehair is applied to the pot. The pot is then taken and I actually put it back into an electric kiln to slow the cooling down again because of thermal shock because the pots will crack. It's quite a harsh process, as I said before. So I like cylinders with straight sides for the horsehair, because what you get with that as well is not only the horsehair markings, but you get these gorgeous smoke markings. This has permeated the clay surface. It's then cleaned thoroughly, and then it's waxed with a microcrystalline wax um, developed by the British Museum, actually. And it's a specialist wax. It doesn't go yellow. It won't make my whites yellow. They stay bright and white. So um, that I'm is- Sorry to jump in. We do have a few questions. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, sorry. Um, one question was, um, do you apply gold after the refire? Um, with my clay, with this gl green glaze at the moment, yes, I do, because it's a luster and luster works on top of a glaze. So it's an extra firing. So it's, you know, it's extra risk in firing, but that's the only way to do it with a luster. These pieces, which are the silver and black pieces that I've been working on, um, at the moment, this is a fairly new piece that I've been working on. This is the naked clay body. So, but, and this is the silver glaze. So that one is one firing because it's actually a glaze itself, but it has silver in it. So the deposits that are left on the pot are silver. So that would be fired in exactly the same way as the green one firing less. This would just be the, the you know, the, the final uh, Raku firing. Did you have any other questions, Lucky? Yes. Uh, what do you use to burnish your work? 
Um, to burnish it, um, I have a little stone. I have a special stone that nobody touches that is on a very high shelf <laughs> and it's uh, got pressures written on it. But I have found, because um, it's a lot of burnishing, and I tend to do that when I have my coffee in the morning because it's time consuming, but it's really important. I have found that um, a candle light bulb, it helps, it works really well. Um, the clay has to be on the firm side of leather hard, um, but a, uh, yeah, a candle light bulb is really quite good. It's the best one. I've tried many different materials, that's a good one. With terra sigillata, I can put the piece, um, uh, if, it's a, if it's a globe, I can put it on the wheel, but otherwise I can put it on a sponge and I can just use the plastic because the terra sigillata puts a really fine plastic uh, clay type coating on the outside of the pot. So that's done with the plastic bag. So hopefully that answers that question. Was there anything mm -hmm. else? Um, yeah, just another one. Um, where do you buy the wax from? Uh, what is the name of the wax? Um, it's called Renaissance Wax, and it's a microcrystalline wax. Um, it's quite expensive. I mean, I it's it's about ninety five pounds for for um, a liter, but it lasts a very long time. Uh, you can buy it in smaller quantities. It is expensive, expensive, but. If you have made, um, you know, I've got the blue here. I don't then want to wax this blue with something that's going to tint it yellow like an ordinary wax. It's, I would never use an ordinary wax on something like this. It would take away from that delicate color, which is, you know, has taken a while to come to um, experiment and get to. So Raku is experimentation. I'm trying things all the time. And I mean that I'm also going to start to do some experiments with ferric chloride, but that's quite a, a uh, an, uh, dangerous thing to use. So I need to make sure that actually I do that um, gloved up and uh, with plastics, no metals, you know. So I'm experimenting all the time. I have also used for some of these pots, I've used a terracotta clay. It's a terracotta clay that goes to stoneware. You can, it's best, best not to use, uh, porcelain is hopeless, it just cracks. It doesn't take thermal shock very well. And earthenware is a bit on the weak side too. I have used earthenware, but stoneware clays, and actually any stoneware clay is good. So I'm always experimenting with different clays. I've also, used some um, sodium silicate to give me a lovely gnarly bark like top to a pot again it the bottom is waxed the top is waxed so just to finish and help seal the carbon in um, I mean these absolutely I love architecture I love old ruins and when I look at pieces like this like the horsehair i can see those fissures in walls you know from my travels i can be in a restaurant and everybody's looking at the scenery and i'm looking at a lovely cracked gnarly wall taking pictures of that it's that that really interests me and i have found that raku gives me the canvas to actually you can't beat nature and what happens, but you can have a go. You can come close and you can work out your own way of doing it. And this is a very old method of firing. And I love that. And I love the fact that I can reproduce these completely unique markings. I can't dictate the markings. You know, they're, they're dramatic, but there's also a softness to them as well. So that, that is basically what I do. And... Um, will continue to do for as long as I possibly can. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, we do have another question. Um, so do you not you do you not have to use a burning terra sig sigulata? I do use um, terra sigulata. I use it. Um, I don't always use it. Um, it depends. Sometimes I want a marbly effect. So for things like um, this where I want a really polished finish, where it's really important to have that very smooth polished finish, I would always use the terra sigillata. If I want something that is more stone-like, 
then I will use, I will burnish without the terrace gelata. It gives me a slightly different feel to the pot. And each pot, as I said, there's a lot of planning goes into the pot before I even start, you know, with the material. Um, and then, so that's the bit I can control. The bit that gives me these unique markings happens in the firing that I can't do anything about. And um, so, yes, it's, it depends on the final effect and that's planning before I start. So that's that. Is there anything else, any other questions? <laughs> that was wonderful. I can't believe how quickly 15 minutes has already gone. I know, <laughs> I know, I know I'm going over, I'm, I'm in danger of going over my time. <laughs> no, no, that's fine. I mean, if you have anything else to show us, you know, um, by all means. I do have, there's a, a pot here. Uh, I'll just bring this one over. I have, um, I love, I just love the simplicity of this. And this was really playing out, playing around and just being playful with it. Because as I say, it is all experimentation. I don't know which pots are going to crack through. If I want a particular pot, then I make three of them on the basis that one of them will make it all the way through. And unfortunately with this process, if they're going to fail, it's right at the end when, <laughs> you know, when you've, you've planned, made, finished, put it in the kiln, it comes out and then, you know, it's, it's gone. But when it doesn't crack, it's very pleasing indeed. And I don't know what I'm gonna get until I take it out of the sawdust and it's cooled down. I have no idea what's going to happen in you know in that um that through that process the final process but uh, this was a playful piece and i I'm, uh, i quite like that piece this goes in my tall raku kill but um yeah it's it's a joy it's fun i love it um and i think i'll be continuing with raku for a while i'm going to work with some um, some ferric fluoride but i won't do that when i have other folk around um, that gives the lovely umber um, colours and rust colours. So that's something else to try. So, and I'm constantly looking to experiment, um, you know, the sodium silicate as well. I mean, I, I love it. So, you know, just simple green glaze inside with the lovely crackles and then the sodium silicate. This one I slashed um, after I had made and, and then pushed a little bit further. I'm always trying to push. I'm always trying to do something a little bit more difficult, um, but it's just a joy. I love this material. I love the clay material and all its possibilities. So, you know, I shall carry on and I carry on with the teaching and bringing it to as many people as possible. That it's is my... wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, my pleasure. Lee. That was amazing. And thank you everyone for joining us. Um, you know, um, sorry, we just got another question. Um, where do you teach? Um, I teach in my studio. I have a, a, a studio, an old stable block at home that I converted into a studio a long time ago. And um, after my degree, I, I was glass blowing for a while. And then the call of the clay, I set up in my studio. And I found that teaching actually made me more disciplined about every aspect of looking after the studio and being organized. And I found that's been really beneficial. And I love people coming in. I love just to pass on everything that I possibly can, you know, recipes, everything. Um, and in fact, I think probably at least half a dozen people that started with me have now set up their own studios, which is really pleasing. And I've helped them, helped them with that as well. So, um, you know, I'm in South Bucks and there are a lot of people who are absolutely smitten with this, with clay, working with clay. So it's a joy. Amazing. You do have a lot of compliments coming in. <laughs> ah, <laughs> thank you. I believe some people have already seen you in person and, um, but yeah, they love your work. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you so much, Wendy. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. But more importantly, thank you, Wendy, for presenting your work and talking us through your techniques with Raku. Um, if you can, please do go ahead and visit Wendy's shop. I've popped it in uh, the chat box. You can just click on the link and then you can head over there and see her items or for sale. 
Um, so thank you again, everyone, for joining us. We will be having another live session uh, within the next few hours. So please join us for that. We will be, uh, it will be led by Alice, who is another member of Handmade in Britain. But for now, we'll say goodbye. But thank you again. Uh, and we'll see you next time. <laughs> okay, thanks. Bye. Thank Bye, you. Lucky. Bye.